Isim? Do, do you want us to turn off the videos? Because are there some of you who need us to do that because of, uh, of the internet and stuff? Or is it better to have videos on? At least people presenting, of course, need to be on. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's probably better to turn off video for not talking because it'd be hard to know until it's kind of annoying and too late. If yeah. It does like people's bandwidth. Mm. Yes. So please do that. And if you want to um, comment or something, you can use the chat or also raise your hand and we'll try to manage that. Um, my name is Inger Utrum and I've taken over this chair uh, of the group um, because, um, yeah, Veronica couldn't make it, so, uh, and I was going to be here nonetheless. My name is, uh, and I'm working at Vid Specialized University with Inger Hanna Benvik. Uh, and I, we will follow the, the program as, as uh, it was planned, and every group has about 20 minutes, 50 minutes presentation and five minutes for questions or comments. Uh, and um, I suppose you would like to discuss it more, but then you know who you can contact afterwards. And the, the um, framework for this parallel sessions uh, is, as uh, Emily said, um, a group and I, a book we are um, um, in progress of making with the title Living on the Edge, Innovative International Research on Living Care, uh, together with Policy Press. And uh, we really hope this will be a very nice book. And we are, are happy to have all the authors, or almost all the authors together with us today. Just a few words, and then we'll give the words to the, um, the presenters. Uh, when we're talking about uh, Living on the Edge in this book, uh, living on the edge speaks to the liminality inherent in youth transitions and living care transitions. Furthermore, living on the edge speaks to the precarity experienced by many care laborers who lack the social cap capital and resources to transition into stable education, employment and family life. I'm just reading from the book proposal. Uh, and um, the, uh, it's also origin from the Corrid group. And so a lot of the presenters and, and the authors in the book will be from, from Corrid and that we're very, very happy about that. And we'll also try to have a global representation. And it's three themes. And this theme of this uh, parallel session is about methods of care leaving research. Um, in, innovative field accesses, mindful methods and critical questions on existing methods are taking, are some of the focus in this part of the book. So I think I'll just uh, give the word to uh, you, Jade, and um, I'll try to uh, follow the time and say if you're yeah, using too much, then I'll make you stop. <laughs> I'll, I think we'll manage. And then you can say, present yourself and the, and the topic and the presentation. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so I'm just gonna share my screen for the PowerPoint, which means that I won't be able to see anything, I think. Um, so, hello to everyone. Um, I'm Jade from Australia. Uh, I'm presenting here tonight quite late in the evening. Um, it's about 10.30 PM and I'm tired. Um, I'm presenting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people and um, I just want to firstly acknowledge any First Nations people around the world before I begin my presentation today. Um, I'm presenting my chapter in progress for the Corrit book, Living on the Edge, as has been explained, and I'm presenting on um, trauma-informed approaches to research and how to balance methodological rigour with empowering practice and using the resources that we have available to us. So I'm studying at Monash University, um, supervised by Professor Philip Mendes, and um, I'm looking at care leavers and early parenting in my research. 
and I'll be taking you through a few things that I've learned working with and conducting research with hard to reach care leavers. Um, so to give you some context for Australia, until recently in most states, young people who'd been placed into care were routinely discharged from the accommodation financial and other supports provided by child protection services at the age of 18 or earlier. And with many countries around the world, this is in contrast to other young people who uh, typically rely on family and social networks for financial, emotional and housing support into their early and mid twenties. Rates of homelessness for care leavers in their first year after leaving care are consistently reported to be around 30% nationally in Australia. Affordable housing is uh, rare, with a recent study reporting that uh, just 3% of all properties for rent were affordable and appropriate for households on government income support payments. And for households on a minimum wage, it was 22% of available properties were affordable. Despite the clear challenges for young people leaving care, this cohort appears to have far higher rates of early parenting than other Australians. Early parenting amongst care leavers presents a high risk of poverty and child protection involvement. Some care leavers may have few supportive relationships and might be lacking in the supports that other young or older parents can rely on through family, social and community networks. It's therefore important to examine care leavers' experiences of parenting uh, their children within the context of the impacts of their pre-care, in-care and post-care experiences and the supports that they have available to them. So many studies of leaving care experience some difficulty or expend significant resources trying to locate care leavers to invite to be part of their research. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare conducts research on the views of children and young people in care. Um, they have the assistance of case managers, departmental staff and other support persons. Their 2018 study was offered to 4,500 young people in care and 53% uh, of the sample completed that survey. Australia's National Peak Body for the Voice of the Child in Out-of-Home Care, the CREATE Foundation, maintains a membership program for children and young people who take part in any of the organisation's events or programs. CREATE has offices that run events and programs in each state and territory, and they had contact details for over 3,000 Club CREATE members who are over 18. Um, and so for their last uh, national survey, the data collection period spanned 15 months and 325 care leavers completed their survey on transitions from care, which was a response rate of 10%. Several studies investigating outcomes for care leavers in the United States have maintained very high response rates. Um, Courtney and colleagues detail the procedures used to maintain a response rate of 95.3% uh, for wave one of their longitudinal study, the Kelly study, um, and 84.7% of original respondents at wave three. Uh, the wave three report tells us that this was done by um, youth who were selected into the study were mailed an advance letter containing a $5 bill to introduce the study. The letter explained that an interviewer would be in contact with them in a few weeks and efforts were made to contact participants via phone to obtain initial consent to participate in the study and to arrange an in-person interview. If a youth did not answer the phone, messages were left for the youth or caretakers and the young person had the option to return the phone call to a toll free number or to send a text message. When participants could not be reached by phone, interviewers made an in-person visit to their home. Um, if none of these direct attempts were successful in reaching the participant, then interviewers contacted the participant's child welfare worker if they were still in care um, or other individuals um, who'd been provided by the youth during the baseline interview and asked them for assistance in contacting the respondent. 
Um, they were then offered 60 US dollars as cash incentive paid by the interviewer at the end of the interview. Um, so numerous studies, including care leaver parents have identified a fear amongst them of having their own children removed, which extends to a fear of what's termed surveillance bias. And um, as a result, sorry, the fear of being reported to child protection is said to discourage the use of services, which if it's true, is a paradox of child protection because it creates more risk and greater disadvantage for concerned parents. And as a result, care leaver parents might be hesitant to participate in research. So realising the significant risks that a young parent transitioning from care might perceive in talking about their parenting experiences and potentially parenting challenges, particularly given what's known about care leavers, lack of resources and supports in many cases, I felt that conducting research with this group would be challenging. I was also aware that if a research participant disclosed or even appeared as though uh, that they weren't coping, I had little additional support to offer beyond telephone counselling helpline phone numbers, um, but I might be obliged to report the care experience parent to child protection services if there was a perceivable risk to the child. Uh, Mandy's and Rogers in a 2020 article on extended care estimated that approximately 20% of care leavers are disengaged from welfare service systems. It would seem unlikely that people who aren't engaging with services would be reachable or interested to participate in research studies, especially in research that requires surveys to be completed or programs to be engaged with. Where are these young people represented in research evidence then? The care leavers that we're most concerned about in relation to wicked social problems are those that we know least about. So to protect the interests and safety of vulnerable populations, human research ethics committees carefully consider academic research designs. Ethical research practice requires clear informed consent so that participants are fully informed of the reasons for the research and freely able to choose whether they wish to participate in it. Dawn Manet and colleagues argue that young people who have experienced placement in out of home care have experienced many assessments and interventions where questions answered by them have resulted in their removal from their families. It's argued that social work research should not replicate the style of investigation of child protection or other involuntary interventions to ensure that participation in research feels like it's a choice. In the current study where care experience, parents' experience are being investigated, I've agreed with Manay and colleagues noting that participants may also have experiences with being investigated themselves by social workers as parents. Considering these issues, I decided it was very important that the data collection process I designed for speaking to care leaver young parents should be well informed and carefully planned to make the most of any contribution that this hard to reach group might make to my research. Additionally, the literature review had revealed further layers of vulnerability amongst the care leaver early parenting cohort, including sexual exploitation and family violence. I decided with my supervisors that I should begin my study with a less vulnerable research population, professionals or service providers as I've termed them, um, people who are experienced in working with young people transitioning from care who became pregnant or early parents. So a PhD project is a rare opportunity to explore an issue in depth and sometimes more autonomously than a research in industry or academia allows. And in ideal circumstances uh, where resources such as my time were unlimited, I might have designed my study on care leaver early parenting in partnership with care experienced young parents. I could have, with ethical approval, spent time with young parents' educational programs, uh, for example, and built relationships that led to uh, potential participation in focus groups to identify what young parents believed were the main issues facing young parents 
who were transitioning from care. Without the time to develop such relationships, I instead decided to create focus group sessions that positioned participants as experts by experience with the hope that this would prove an attractive opportunity for young people and for the service providers that I would have to contact to find young people who might be willing to participate in my research. So I also opened the invitation to care leavers who hadn't had children to expand the cohort and to open up possibilities for learning about pathways out of care that didn't lead to early parenthood. When submitting an ethics application to conduct research with young people themselves, the ethics committee was concerned that recruiting care leavers through service providers created an environment where young people might feel coerced to participate in the research because their service provider was asking them on behalf of the researchers. The ethics committee was further concerned that the informed consent documents should be very specific about procedures in case of any disclosure of potential child abuse. Uh, Keller and colleagues have highlighted matters in relation to interview topics, explaining information about a care leaver's life, which may involve numerous traumatic events such as abuse, neglect, loss and other disadvantage. Typically, research design strategies to protect against distressing participants include detailed informed consent processes to ensure a potential participant understands what topics they will, ask, they will be asked to speak about and if they consent to being part of the study. There's a balance to be struck here between alerting potential participants to what may be discussed and the reactions that may be caused and raising distressing issues through the flagging of them. Keller and colleagues note that it's not possible for the researcher to know what the full range of emotional consequences is for each individual and going in too hard on this may deter participation. So we're just moving on to uh, youth participation theories here. Uh, youth participation theories are increasingly influential in research and policy with care experienced young people. These rights based participation models highlight ways that research has previously been conducted on rather than investigated with young people. I don't have time to go over these in detail, they're very interesting, but um, these few examples demonstrate the concerns that these approaches have with sharing decision making power. Um, with young people or even giving power over to young people to um, make decisions and set the agendas independently. The highest rung on this heart's ladder here is for youth-led participation and research is not youth-led typically. Um, Laura Lundy's participation model uh, emphasises the need for young people's voices to be heard but also for that to be acted upon by decision makers. Uh, research typically can't guarantee any action that will be taken. Um, and the third model we have here is Wong and colleagues. Uh, they propose that shared power is the ideal with partnerships between decision makers and young people at the um, top of their hierarchy. So, these kinds of approaches are precluded by academic research because the ethics application must present a range of detailed procedures that are proposed in carrying out the research before any consultation with young people can begin. Um, also, academic culture can elevate less participatory research methods above others if they're considered more objective and more rigorous. Systematic review methodologies, for example, might preclude qualitative or non-experimental design research because of judgments that they're not evidence-based. There are difficulties with both of these arguments when we look to the care leaver cohort as their omission from research due to uh, some of them being disengaged means that they might not be represented in a lot of research evidence, including evidence that's already regarded as very rigorous. 
what if participatory qualitative research methods are the most likely kinds to attract disengaged cohorts? So my feelings are that methodological approaches that are fit for purpose will most likely serve best. And uh, so I've developed a model that we can use for assessing what might be fit for purpose in any given situation. So um, here with resource mapping, that's uh, considering in advance um, how much time you have, how many staff and people you'll have to work on the project, um, what the funding will cover, and whether or not you already have access to young people who might be interested in participating or not. And uh, we also have modes of inquiry to consider. So um, you want to avoid replicating unpleasant experiences and create a safe place. And also um, you can do that by veering away from personal questions and asking young people more about their expertise. And so they're not recounting traumatic experiences as much. And also um, young people who've been in care are experts in more than their own lives. They uh, have often seen many of our service systems from the inside and have many informative perspectives on those. So the other thing to consider is who's the audience and what kind of influence do they have? So uh, that's the end of the presentation and uh, Philip and I are doing some research coming up on youth participation at the moment. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, please get in touch. And otherwise, I'll hand back over for all the other presentations that are part of Global Intrack this year. Thank you. Thank you, Jade, for raising really important questions. And I'm looking forward to read your book chapter. Uh, if, we, if anybody has a short question, we have... Some just two minutes time for that or comments or um, yes, you can write it in, in the chat or raise your hand or you can talk to Jade in other ways if that's okay. <laughs> yes, I, I don't, yeah, wonderful presentation is in the chat. Thanks. Yes, you can look in the chat, Jade, and see the comments. I think maybe uh, since there's a lot of program and we don't have so much time, we'll just continue the presentations. And, and if you have questions in later on, and, or you can write it in the chat and the or authors can comment in the chat as well. Um, then